Smells like human spirit. Okay, welcome back to the show, everyone. I am your usual host, Guy Evans. And firstly, before we get started here, I'd just like to introduce the special guest host for today's podcast, James Wilson. James, how are you doing? Hello, hello. Yes, I'm very well. Thank you, Guy. Thanks for having me on, buddy. Excellent. And secondly, uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, guest for today's show, a returning guest. I think this is either his third or maybe even fourth appearance at this point. He's a researcher, filmmaker, author of the book uh, Secret Spies and 7-7. We always love having him on the show. Uh, as a sidebar, he's also uh, an electronic music creator in his spare time. His name is Tom Secker. Tom, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm very good guy. And James, it's, it's good to be talking to you guys again. I guess the natural place to start, Tom, uh, is just by asking you, what have you been up to since the last time that we spoke? I know that you've launched your podcast now, the Clandestine Podcast, which is, seems to be going very well. But in general, what have you been up to since the last time we spoke? Well, that's been the main sort of creative project that I've been doing uh, in that I launched the podcast in, oh, help me out here, August? <laughs> I can't quite yep. remember. Something like that. It was shortly after we last spoke, anyway, because we, we, we were talking about my book last time. Um, mm -hmm. So that's essentially been a weekly show, apart from a brief hiatus in November, and that was all because I was devoting quite a lot of time to putting together my presentation for this uh, conference in Lille, in France, that James Corbett got me invited to. So thank you, James. And, and that was one of my highlights of last year, really. I had an awful lot of fun there, not just you know, going and doing a presentation that mm. went down pretty well, and you can watch the video of that online, actually. Um, but also getting to meet James Corbett, that was interesting, because this is a guy who I first, I don't know, got in contact with back in 2010, maybe. We'd sort of known each other online for four years before we actually met, you know, in the flesh. So that's a... It, it was sort of surreal for a moment, but yeah, we had a lot of fun together. It was It was really good meeting him, so... That's some of the stuff I've been up to. What else would you like to know? Um, this conference, so what was it about? So what did you go into and um, how many people were there? The number of people there varied from day to day. Um, we're talking at most a few hundred. Mm. But wow. it, was, it was an academic conference. It was organised by essentially an academic institute in France. Uh, it's called FOSSA, which stood for, stands for Free Open Source Software for Academia. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, academics are not very good at being short-winded. But yeah, basically it started out as a bunch of software engineers who were particularly into developing open source, that is, community-developed free software that everyone can pitch in and modify and try and develop and enhance and progress. What, um, rather than the Adobe's and this and that? Well, rather than the software, like, yeah, like you say, being owned privately by a corporation yeah. and they own the software and you can't do anything with it. All you can do with it are the options that are built into it that they've provided. So they were into building software, particularly for academic purposes, for, you know, data mining or whatever, analysis of different things, uh, whatever you might use software for, for that matter. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm all for this stuff. Uh, <clears throat> Not that I'm a software programmer, I don't have my head around that, but mm -hmm. I use a open source uh, software for my email and for my internet, which is probably the two main things that I use my computer for. So, you know, I'm, I'm all in favour of this, and, and frankly, Internet Explorer is crap, so why mm. would anyone use it? Seriously, if there is anyone out there listening to this still using Internet Explorer, don't. <laughs> any, yeah. any other browser is better. Um, I know there's a, a lot of people, of course, against the Internet Explorer, and um, I know a lot, a lot of a few software developers, you know, um, graphic designers, people who are, um, well, especially website developers who are very annoyed um, with, say, Adobe and other big companies coming in and destroying the coding and completely mastering the coding so you can't um, manufacture it yourself, you know, and they're very annoyed, you know, and they've almost gone out of business. It, it's a sort of a new generation now sort of a few years later where all these 
global companies own all the real code and you can't develop something yourself from scratch anymore. Well, a lot of stuff has been copyrighted and a lot of stuff has been patented and what have you. And, of course, it's the big corporations who got there first, so that's the people who own most of the patents that do exist. Mm. But still, programming is programming, and programmers are generally quite imaginative people. Otherwise, they wouldn't be, you know, messing around with programming, trying to make software do interesting things. Yeah. So they will always find a way around it, and they always have found a way around it. Um, and so, anyway, this conference was about a bunch of programmers involved in all of this sort of thing. And in this year in particular, having run it for several years, mostly for software-type people, they were reaching out to other open-source disciplines, and so they got open-source journalism. There was a whole day devoted to that, and they got people like James uh, Corbett in there, and he suggested me. So... My presentation was on open source intelligence, um, and the title was What Connects the Walsall Anarchists, Nazi Pigeons, and Ben Affleck. And it was a sort of light-hearted introduction to the kind of work that I do and how I go about researching things, where I get my information from, mm -hmm. and how it is you go about investigating the intelligence services without using secret sources, without using insiders and leaks and all of that kind of thing. So okay. that's what it was about. I'm curious to ask, Tom, uh, you know, how would you rate your experience doing the podcast so far? As you said, you're about six months into the project. I think you've done, uh, if I recall correctly, about 17 or 18 shows at this point. Uh, what's it been like to um, produce this podcast to this point? Um, it's been an awful lot of fun because I was someone who started out being associated primarily with the 7-7 issue and more broadly the state terrorism, Al-Qaeda, war on terror issue. And there's a lot of other things that I'm interested in. At that point, I was very focused on that because there were particular things I wanted to accomplish, like making the two films and writing a book. So making the podcast was one of the main reasons was to enable me basically to talk about other things and see if people were interested in what I had to say on other kinds of topics. So for me, it's been a really interesting experience. I found, <coughs> I found that the episodes I enjoyed making the most are the ones that proved the most popular and that other people enjoyed the most. So right. I think there's a real lesson in there for me. Um, it, it, it's, very good positive feedback, it's encouraging, but also in terms of going forward with what I'm actually going to do with this, what I'm actually going to try and hope to accomplish by doing this show, I think there is a lesson there for me that I'm best off sticking to the things I most enjoy talking about because um, that's what people want, <laughs> seem to enjoy listening to me talk about, if you like. Sure. Do you think there's a, a danger of being really pigeonholed once you once you sort of come on the scene and start talking about a particular issue? Uh, for you, of course, it was seven seven. That seemed to be every time you made an appearance on a podcast or a radio show, what have you. That was the the topic that you usually discussed. Um, did you find that that after a period of time, people just came to see you as the seven seven guy and actually didn't allow you to kind of broaden your horizons and talk about other things? Um. I didn't find that with podcasts particularly because most of the podcasts I've been on have, to be fair, been shows like this one where you study, you know, you look at all sorts of different things. When you get guests on, you do generally talk about their area of expertise, but you usually get them onto some other topics as well. Um, mm -hmm. you, you in particular, the guy, are very good at that. You're very good at getting them off the beaten track, if you like, and so they're not just repeating the same thing that they've said a dozen times before. Um, and so... I haven't faced that so much with podcasts, largely because <laughs> I've been fortunate that the people who've invited me on have been good people like you. Um, I have faced that a bit more in as much as I've got involved in the kind of meet-up truth movement that exists in this country, in that most people do just, in that, look on me as a 7-7 guy, and that's all I get asked about. And Yeah, I think you get... I think, it, yeah, I found it more that I've got pigeonholed socially, if you like, rather than in the media realm. Interesting. Well, I think I may have asked you this question the last time that we spoke, or perhaps the time before, and I don't mean this to come out in the wrong way, but we're nine years after 7-7. How uh, fresh is that day on the, the, the minds and, and souls, if you like, of the British public? You know, are people 
still uh, conscious of, of, of just what happened that day and how important it was? Or in your view, as someone who studied it, studies this and looks at the media coverage of it and so on, has it just become really a, a distant memory at this point? I don't think it's just a distant memory. Um, it's not very present in the minds of most people, hardly any people for that matter. It's It's basically just now part of the background tapestry of British life, that, you know, this horrible thing happened. That's mm-hmm. basically all it really means to people anymore. Um, and I mean, not to, not to cut you off, Tom, but it, it's just, it occurs to me that for several years after 7-7, people would refer to 9-11, 7-7, and other horrible uh, acts of terrorism. They would kind of lump those two days together, and now it seems like, of course, 9-11... Uh, is something that's, that's always mentioned, and, and 7-7 not so much. That's just my perspective, someone on the, the outside looking in. Well, and someone who's living on that side of the Atlantic. But sure, to be mm. honest, the British media isn't that different. I'm, I'm not sure, but I would say that 9-11 probably still gets more token media mentions or references in the British media than 7-7 does. Mm. So, yeah, just like I say, it's sort of... When you say 7-7 seven, seven to people, I think most people, it evokes, oh, wasn't that some horrible thing? It was that those Muslim suicide bombers. And that's about it. Switching gears a little bit here, Tom, I'm very interested in getting your take on Edward Snowden. And I just want to let everyone know, if they head over to spyculture.com, you can listen to Tom's podcast where he goes into this uh, in a lot of depth and really provides a, a very well thought out analysis. And I don't mean to reduce you know, all of his work to just a soundbite or a couple of minutes here. But uh, I know, Tom, that you've displayed a lot of skepticism surrounding um, Edward Snowden, his backstory, what he stands for, what he has said and so on. Um, I just for full disclosure, I uh, do disagree with you on that respectfully. Um, I don't share that view, but I'm, as I've said on the podcast before, I like to think that I'm open minded and just want to give you the opportunity to kind of make your case for why you haven't re- really been certain about his intentions from the beginning. Why, why were you so skeptical about him from the start? I was skeptical about it primarily because of the media coverage. Normally, the media do not linger on a story for very long, and they certainly don't tend to linger on security state stories for very long. So the fact that they were on this suggested to me something out of the ordinary. Because normally when you have a whistleblower, you'll get, if they're lucky, you'll get some proper media coverage and you'll get a sort of brief flurry of interviews and maybe a few follow-up articles, but that'll usually be about it. Then it's yesterday's news, it's chip paper, so people have moved on. With Snowden, the story just ran and ran and ran. And I was kind of... I'm I'm inherently sceptical of anyone who used to work or says they used to work for the security services as to whether or not they really do have, have actually severed that relationship. And nothing that Snowden's done since then, to my mind, suggests that he has severed that relationship. And when you go into the background of who Snowden is and you look at his entire adult life, he spent the entire time working for different branches of the security state. He joined the special forces when he apparently broke both of his legs in some training training accident or incident. Uh, he drops out of the special forces. Okay, he then goes to work at an advanced psychological research centre, which works with the NSA and CIA. He then joins the CIA... He's posted as an undercover agent to Geneva. When he leaves the CIA, he becomes an NSA contractor and then has this um, this meteoric rise in the NSA to the point that he's apparently this systems administrator who can access absolutely everything and supposedly downloaded thousands, if not millions, of documents. And the whole thing, just to me, it doesn't sound like someone who is then going to become a whistleblower. It sounds like someone who is a spy through and through. And so when you look at, um, in particular, what's happened with Glenn Greenwald, in that he's got into bed with a PayPal billionaire in order to launch media ventures, and when asked about this, when Sibel Edmonds, a real whistleblower, asked Snowden about this, wrote an open letter saying, is this what you did this for? Is this what this great sacrifice that you supposedly made was all about? Was so that the journalist could make millions of dollars out of it. 
Snowden then issues a statement a few days later saying this is mission accomplished. So how else are we supposed to take that guy? That's what I'd ask you is how could you still maintain, given what's happened now with Greenwald in particular, how could you still maintain the, the view that he's a, he's a good man, to be honest? Well, let me ask you this question. If indeed Snowden was someone that was pushed out there by the, the NSA or the CIA or whoever, uh, if they made a conscious decision that, okay, we're going to release this information, he's going to be the face of this, this operation, he's still working for us, uh, clearly, but we're going to, we're going to manufacture this idea that he's uh, a whistleblower, what would they have to gain from doing that? Why, what would be the initial sort of reason for why they would do that? Um, well, I went into several different reasons in the episode of my podcast I did on this, but the basic idea, or the sort of broad idea, would be to make it seem like the system is working, that, you know, the NSA is doing some terrible things, but it's okay, because a whistleblower came out and told us that this was going on, not because, you know, <laughs> some kind of oversight agency found this out and managed to shut them down, but because someone came out and a few documents got published in a newspaper. And it all makes it seem like, you know, government's still working properly, the mainstream media is still doing their job, everyone's still doing their democratic duty, therefore everything's fundamentally okay. Mm. Where surely the message from this should be, everything's fundamentally not okay, because this isn't okay. What we're, If you've learnt about this through the Snowden coverage, all right, fine, but... If you'd, if you'd been looking for it beforehand, you would have found abundant material on this. This is not a new story. Sure. It's just a story that has got a lot of traction right now. So, yeah, I think the fundamental message should be, this is not okay. And I don't get that message from the way this story has been presented. I don't get it from Snowden or Greenwald or any of their behavior or any of their statements. Well, I agree with you as much as uh, all of this information, pretty much, uh, you know, th this was known prior to Edward Snowden coming on the scene. I think you said that in a previous appearance on the show, Tom, that mm. really you didn't, you didn't learn that much from uh, Edward Snowden's uh, quote unquote revelations. However, we, we can't apply the same standard to the public at large, because I think when we talk about the masses, I think most people were partially or even completely unaware that this type of surveillance state actually existed. So, uh, again, I, I, I sort of struggle to uh, comprehend why uh, they would release this information if it's actually informed the public on a much wider level, got people angry, got people talking, and uh, I think out of this we're probably going to get some sort of reform or at least... Uh, you know, continue the discussion about the role that surveillance plays in our lives. So it's it's kind of just intensified those fears and those worries that people already had, uh, because now everyone's aware of surveillance. Everyone everyone knows what the NSA is. Everyone knows what it does. Everyone is talking about this this giant data center in Utah and the fact that they're collecting uh, all of this this data on people. So again, I, I just you know, respectfully, Tom, I, I don't see it, but I want to give you maybe a chance to respond to that. And then, James, I want you to chime in and, well, I, and let us know, gonna, know what your thoughts just are. Just on what you say now, not to completely uh, agree with Tom, but um, I, I do see what he means. And then um, with this whole truth-seeking movement, people want answers. People are aware that we do have mass surveillance. People were unhappy anyway. And now you've got a whistleblower, someone who has jumped out of the um, the mainstream, the, the official version of... Um, the, the, the official companies, someone stepped out and they're saying this and that. It's, people can jump on that bandwagon. So in a way, they've done themselves a favor. It's like, okay, you want a whistleblower? He's, here's your whistleblower. But secretly, you know, he's an official whistleblower. Maybe if that's what you're saying, Tom. Well, or he's a, a false flag whistleblower. Or yeah, something. a false flag, yeah. Um, well, okay, Guy. I, yeah, I understand. That's a perfectly valid line of questioning. My, my response to that would be, Surely that was the whole point, because this is what secret services and secret organizations always do. They never maintain the notion of absolute secrecy, the idea of being able to affect the world in a significant way while maintaining complete secrecy is a nonsense. So what all secret services have always done is slowly drip feed what they're doing, what they're really doing to the public. I mean, along the same lines of inquiry. Why is it that we know that MI6 exists? Why even tell us? 
why even, you know, put that on, on the legislative record? Because at one point, well, for most of its existence, for about 70 years, it wasn't officially acknowledged. It was officially denied, effectively. And then in the 1990s, the early 1990s, they said, no, MI5 and MI6 exist. And this is the, you know, act of parliament by which they're supposed to operate. Why do that? Why do any of it? Well, that information is eventually going to leak out, so it's better for them to admit to it rather than admit, it leaking out. And, and admit it. to it in a way that makes them look how they want to look. Because what's the point of having all this surveillance on ordinary people who aren't really doing anything? Unless the point is to scare the crap out of them and make them feel like they're being watched. And what's the point of doing that unless you tell them that they're being watched? So what is Snowden doing? He's telling everyone they're being watched. And no one can do anything about it, right? Or, well, he's not really suggesting what we should do about it, is he? He keeps saying... No, he's telling us, that's oh, what no, I mean. I didn't, I didn't want society to change. I just wanted to give it the opportunity to change. Well, OK, we've got the opportunity. Has it changed? Has it hell? So, I'll point you to one thing, Guy, that mm -hmm. just to kind of round this off, because otherwise we'll sure. probably continue arguing with James trying to play referee for quite a while. <laughs> but, but that's all good fun. Um, in Snowden's alternative Christmas message, he made a comparison mm -hmm. where he said, uh, he talked about George Orwell's 1984, and said that present-day surveillance is much, much worse. But the truth is, it isn't. In 1984, everyone had a camera inside their home that was there mandatory. They couldn't cover it up. If they did, they'd be a suspect or declared a dissident or whatever. Compared to, compare that to a mobile phone that you buy voluntarily, that you carry around voluntarily, that you can turn on and off. It's not the same thing. Modern surveillance is nowhere near as totalitarian as in 1984, yet Snowden's message was, it's even worse now. What's the point of that unless it is to scare the crap out of people? Well, I think you make a good point there. I, I, I certainly agree with you on that one in those terms. Um, but still, to me, that doesn't convince me that, that he's a fraud necessarily. Maybe that's just a poor choice of words or a lack of, uh, of perhaps research on his part. I'm not sure. But the, the, one, thing, the one thing that I will say is uh, I think it's healthy to be skeptical about pretty much anything in life. I think it's, it's healthy to look at things and not necessarily believe you know, what we're told from the jump. And... Uh, Hey, you know, who knows? Five years from now, Tom, we may have this, this discussion and we could have completely new information at our hands and it, you could very well be right. But to me, from my vantage point, it doesn't feel like this is the case. Uh, from what I know about Edward Snowden, uh, that's not the impression I get, but I'd be very interested in hearing from the listeners. And uh, actually, on that point, Tom, what, what has been the response from your listeners once you came out with this podcast? Did you find that uh, most of the people listening to your show agreed with you? Was it kind of divided? What was the response? Uh, the response was, in as much as I've got feedback, it's been overwhelmingly positive. A lot of mm -hmm. people, I mean, to, to, if you like, compromise my position, I could be wrong about this. I have kind of stuck my neck out on this one, perhaps at too early a point, some would argue. But this is more of a gut instinct with me that I then followed up on, and that's what I found, and so that's what I put in the podcast. Okay, mm -hmm. um, I could be wrong, and there is there are things that would convince me. There are things that would convince me to change my mind. So I suppose one of my main reasons for doing this is that I didn't think there was enough scepticism about this. I thought there were lots of valid questions that a lot of people weren't asking, and so I thought, I'll ask them, and then I'll answer them in the way that my instinct and my research is taking me. So... Yeah, I, I could be wrong about it. The Like you say, the point is, be sceptical. So I think that's resonated with people. I think a lot of people who got back with positive feedback said that they enjoyed it, that they were very interested by it. Even if they weren't convinced or they didn't agree, they thought it was you know valuable that someone was pursuing this line of inquiry. So, yeah, that was good. Absolutely. And we need we need those people to, to question everything. We need people to present an alternative viewpoint. And I think, you know, what what you do is, is very valuable in that regard. Um, switching subjects once again, I'd like to ask you about, I guess, another public figure, but in a much sort of different realm of society. Someone who's been in the news as of late. I've done a couple of podcasts talking about him, and that's Russell Brand. And uh, He's always in the news about something, isn't he? 
he, he, he always seems to be in the news about something. He's had a couple of high-profile interviews, first with Jeremy Paxman and then with Jon Snow. And although they were talking about different topics, the kind of common theme was just uh, his kind of anti-authority, anti-politics, anti-government stance, yeah. power to the people and, and all that type of stuff. Um, I think that's resonated with a lot of people. Tom, what are your thoughts on Russell Brand and, and what he's been saying over... I mean, I, we could go back over the past few months, but really, if you look at his track record, yeah. this has been several years now where he's been, uh, at least in, in public, saying these things. Um, <laughs> well, I also did, a, as you know, a podcast on Russell Brand after his Newsnight interview with Jeremy Paxman, and the one-line mm -hmm. version of that is that I think Russell Brand is a low-level John Lennon wannabe, uh, to be honest. Mm. I think he's a celebrity who wants to be taken perhaps more seriously than just as an actor and a comedian. And we shouldn't take him any more seriously than that, because that, that's all he can really do. Um, this isn't a guy who's got... I mean, what's the upshot? That's always what I, what I ask from these very high-profile stories, and in particular, very high-profile stories that are focused on a particular individual, like Snowden or like Russell Brand, um, is what are these people actually bringing to the table? If they're not actively doing something themselves, which quite a lot of people are doing, and they usually don't get anywhere near as much attention as Russell Brand does, um, if they're not actually doing something, what, what is it that they're bringing to the conversation that's constructive? Does he have policies? Not really. He's talking about decriminalising drugs. Well, that's been on the table and been in, in part of the at least fringe mainstream discussion for a long, 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 long time. Mm. Um, that's not something new and he's not the first actor or comic or celebrity of some kind to talk about it so mm. but uh, well as Guy said you know he is resonating with the public I mean um, what, you know, what did he say I, I've got I've sort of um, rustled something up a little well a few minutes nice pun here we go yeah <laughs> That's the start of your comedy career right there. <laughs> well, I've been working on that the last few minutes. Well, no, Russell Brand, with the Paxman interview, he came up and he said, uh, the city expects us to gratefully participate in what amounts to little more than a political hokey-cokey, where every four years we get to choose what colour tie the liar who leads us wears. And he does come up with certain things that, as I said, do resonate with the public. And he even said himself, I can't conjure up a global utopia right now in this hotel room. That's not my job. Um, obviously, we do have brilliant thinkers and organisations that that can do all that thing, all those things for us. But um, he does make um, some good points. I think that will um, once again rustle up um, a, a lot of the people and uh, can bring people together. And hopefully, I mean that's how things start. That's how movements begin. If I could just jump in real quick, uh, Tom, uh, do you see or, or do you see any value in perhaps someone? Maybe it's a, a teenager or a young person that's familiar with Russell Brand only through his acting and his comedy. Do you see any value in terms of them being exposed to some of the ideas that he talks about, perhaps for the first time, just because they're a fan uh, of his work? Maybe they're completely politically disengaged. They have no interest in, in social and political issues whatsoever. But by listening to him, uh, the, the wheels are kind of now put in motion and they, they start to recognize that uh, these are some actual, actual important topics that they should be concerned with. I'll start to take notice. Um, I don't see any value in that moment per se, no, because I don't think... Whatever the reasons are, why people become politically engaged, either the first moment is completely irrelevant to what they end up actually doing, or that first moment completely defines everything that they subsequently end up doing, and they never really get over it. Um, so, I don't. I think there's an awful lot of damage, to be honest, to be done in introducing people to politics through a kind of scruffy, hippie-looking celebrity someone who kind of appears to be cool and kind of appears to be a bit like them. But ultimately, Russell Brand is a multimillionaire who lives in a castle and married Katy Perry. I don't think he's a valid person to turn anyone on to politics, no. Sure, but I mean, I would argue that it's, it's actually quite refreshing that someone with 
uh, his platform and the stage that he does enjoy, being a, a millionaire, as you put it, actually chooses to... I mean, he could go on these TV programs and talk about the most frivolous, ridiculous things in the world, uh, but I think it says something about his character that clearly he cares about where he came from. He, ca- he seems to care about uh, normal working people, and, and personally, I do see some value in that. I think uh, there are people that... <laughs> Quite frankly, and we all know them, uh, some of the things that we've talked about today just, just have no idea that these type of things are going on. And I think, uh, you know, he may not be the one person to create change, but he might spark the mind of someone out there who will create the change. And uh, I think, at least what he's saying, I think that there is a lot of value in that. That's my perspective. Okay, but let's face it, Guy, you're more optimistic than I am. <laughs> um, that, that could be true. Pretty- a common theme running throughout this conversation so far, I think it would be fair to say. Um, The thing is, though, I mean, what what is it that we're actually saying here, that the greater number of people who are in some way engaged in politics, the better? Is that fundamentally sort of your premise here? I I think the more people who occupy their time thinking about important issues, the better, yes. I think when you've got celebrities, you know, you, you, uh, you chucked him into the bunch of celebrities, which, he, which is exactly what he is, with just a celebrity, and um, he's talking about politics and uh, directing people, as Guy mentioned before, people that aren't thinking about politics. He's directing them to that light and some of the problems. He said, like, um, when I was poor and I complained about inequality, people said I was bitter. Now I'm rich and I complain about in- inequality, they say I'm a hypocrite. You know, he can't win. And, you know, he's got a job to maintain. He can't actually make a change himself. But um, he is focusing the light on on a subject that a lot of people who were followers of him wouldn't focus on. I'll put it like this. As sad as this is, and I've said this before on the podcast, you have people out there writing about, let's just take a random uh, topic, or actually a very important topic, uh, global inequality. You can have hundreds and hundreds of people producing blogs, producing podcasts, trying to get the word out on their own. But as sad as this is, if, I don't know, Kim Kardashian or someone tweeted in 140 characters a a stat about global inequality, um, that would have much more of an impact than all of those other people's efforts combined. And I am by no means condoning that. By no means I'm saying that's cool or that's the right thing. I just think that there are a lot of... There are there are a lot of disengaged people out there, you know, in my view. Yes, there are. Um, but to go back to what I was saying before, if that's your fundamental premise, <coughs> then yes, you would naturally see this as a good thing because mm-hmm. you're talking about getting ordinary people essentially engaged in politics in some way. I'm not particularly mm-hmm. interested in that because I don't really see there's much point engaging in the kind of politics that, we're t- that is being suggested here. But isn't Russell Brand essentially saying the same thing? I mean, he's quite explicitly said that he doesn't believe in the political system and we should be devising alternative ways and new ways to completely break off from it. I mean, it's not, it's not as if he's a, a spokesman for the Labour Party or something like that. He's like, at least presents himself as being independent in that in that way. Yet, curiously, was given his platform on the BBC and by a Fabian socialist rag who support the Labour Party. But that's not the only platform he's had. I mean, that, that's no, one no, of them, also, yes. He's so. also got Channel 4, which also appeals to the liberal left, and, of course, Alex Jones. I mean, <laughs> sooner or later, you have to wonder, what's... Do you really expect something in the mainstream media to be genuinely beneficial to us? In general, no. But in this instance, I think it's... You, you think this you is know, a rare exception? As, I don't as, think as it's a, the Snowden thing. No, they, they've got to do what... Pe- people follow Russell Brand, so they have to talk yeah. about what he's saying because he's got that celebrity status. I think it comes down to, from their vantage point, they see it as a circus. They see it as, yeah. we're going to get this guy on, we're going to grill him, we're going to get him wound up, he's going to say some crazy stuff, it's going to drive ratings, it's going to drive clicks and views, yeah. and that's about, that's about the end of it. And you know, people will go back to their, their usual lives. But I, again, maybe I'm optimistic, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I think you know, there's something to be said for that one kid out there who doesn't really care about some of the things we're talking about today, clicking on a YouTube video, hearing Russell Brand speak for the first time, and then you know, taking that a step further and maybe listening to some more credible sources or... Uh, or what have you, um, 
So not necessarily a rare exception, but I think it's it's kind of a mutually beneficial thing. He's obviously got some things to say that he wants to get out there, and I think from the the mainstream media's point of view, it's just you know here's a in their eyes a, a lunatic that we're going to give a bit of airtime, similar to how Alex Jones gets on TV. I mean. You know, I'm not the biggest fan of Alex Jones, but I think it's pretty clear the reason he's allowed to uh, to be on CNN and, and formats like that is because he's going to create you know, a lot of headlines. Well, it's just a, a circus for them, you know. Yeah, sure, he's going to do the escape the boon act. Yeah, I, I kind of get it, but well, that's you know that's what it was on Piers Morgan, to be honest. Oh, that oh. was that was great. That was awesome. But this is what I mean, guy. I said <laughs> I said before off air. I I like this stuff as political entertainment. But yeah, that's sure. all it is to me. I think if you want to say, you know, that was almost as good as an episode of Breaking Bad. OK, fine. But I don't I wouldn't draw any more from it, because to be honest, the sorts of people who are going to make a if you're talking about individuals making a real impact on the world politically, that are really, you know, a really significant impact rather than mm-hmm. the impact that everyone individually makes politically. Um I don't think that they're the sort of person who would be first turned on to this by watching Russell Brand, because I think if they were that sort of person, they wouldn't be watching Russell Brand in the first place. I think they'd realise that the whole cult of celebrity is actually part of the problem, and therefore they wouldn't be looking there for solutions, and therefore the scenario that you're talking about most likely would never happen. Other people who wouldn't be, if you like, exceptional individuals in terms of making a political impact. But if you're talking about a general political engagement, I get it. But like I say, I don't really see politics in those terms. If you see politics in those terms, I see why you think this is positive. If anyone's going out there and saying what they think, expressing their own individuality, their own unique thoughts, and they're trying to make a change, then that's got to be positive. Just just that, I mean, full stop. Not just not, s- not to sorry, <laughs> not go ahead, Tom, go ahead. Here, but people said that about Hitler, um, or anyone else for that matter. I mean, yeah, I, also, I, I would also take issue with the perspective that Russell Brand does particularly care about ordinary working class people. I don't think he necessarily does. I don't know. I can't in- see inside Russell Brand's head, but I get the impression with most of this, whether it's Russell Brand specifically, but in general terms. I don't think they really do care that much about the causes that they talk about. I don't think Cher does particularly care about the rights of gay people in Russia. Yeah, I, I think see what she's, just trying to, she's just trying to appeal to a demographic, trying to shift yeah. some CDs. It's part of their job, isn't it? Look. There's something to be said for that, but for me it just comes down to this man is going to get airtime no matter what because of his popularity as an actor, comedian, and whatever else he does. And he can choose to, if he wants, I'm sure he could go on the BBC and spend 15 minutes talking about his castle and talking about his cars and all the great places he's been on vacation and Justin Bieber or whatever. But instead, he's 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 giving people, I think, some some food for thought. And, uh, you know, it remains to be seen uh, again, not not just a week from now, a month from now, but in, in several years from this conversation, we'll see if Russell Brand's still as visible as he is. Is he still interested in the same causes? Or was it just kind of a flash in the pan? He's trying to appeal, as you put it there, Tom, to a certain demographic, and then he moves on to something else. And I think, you know, uh, only time will tell on that one. That's pretty cool. Most people wouldn't dare to go out and speak and say what he said. Most people wouldn't. But because, but that's part of Russell, Brand, Russell Brand's act. That's his selling point. He can go out and he can say what he wants. Um, but most celebrities wouldn't dare go out and actually even talk about politics. You know, they've got to stick with whatever the record company or, you know, just, just stay in the box. And he's willing to, um, to create his own box, you know, and, um, and why not? I think it's a good thing to listen to. Why not? I think most celebrities appeal to or try to appeal to a particular political demographic in some way or another whether it's done explicitly and overtly like giving an interview on political on a political topic or whether it's more done through you know stylization and song lyrics and what have you i think the whole thing is to some extent um inherently political pop culture i think is inherently political so again i'd I'd say this is why singling out a particular example even if it is someone who is saying things that you agree with and that you think these things need to be said and aren't said enough, I think singling people out is still to kind of play into that, to play into that celebrity culture. And it's just something I'm fundamentally opposed to. So to be honest, to me, it wouldn't matter which celebrity it was and what they were saying. 
and well, how much I, mean, of it I agreed with or didn't. I would still kind of have this reaction, to be honest. Mm-hmm. What about the things that, I mean, like you compared Russell Brand to a like, sort of low light to John Lennon. So what about John Lennon and his um, like bed piece and everything you were saying about politics? I mean, would you throw him into the same um, bracket as you just talked about then? No. most John Lennon had the considerable advantage of cool. being a considerably smarter man than Russell Brand is. And also... I don't know. Being alive at a different time, being alive at a time when more things, I think, were politically possible than are now, uh, at least in terms of how people perceive it anyway. Mm. Um, He also lived in a time when celebrity status wasn't what it is now. I mean, you mentioned Kim Kardashian before. In John Lennon's day, do you honestly think someone could become a top-rate celebrity by releasing a videotape of them having sex with someone? In John Lennon's day, that couldn't happen. In Russell Brand's day, it can things have changed, you know? Mm. Cool. Well, Tom, listen, I want to thank you very much for being on the show uh, once again. I'm going to wrap things up here at this point, and uh, I want to give you the chance to make any final comments in just a second, but I hope the listeners can appreciate this this kind of back and forth, and I, I certainly want to say to you, Tom, I really respect uh, the angle that you're coming from. You know, we see things in a little bit of a different light, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, we have to meet each other up in person and have a fist fight. Um, but Tom, <laughs> well, that's, thank you. I've got to put the rest top back on because I've just taken it off. There you go. Um, but Tom, I w- again, I want to give you the, the chance to make any uh, closing statements here and, and let people know where they can listen to your podcast, where they can get the book and anything else you want to talk about. Well, sure. Since James is evidently sat there without his shirt on and <laughs> you'd, you'd probably beat me in a fight. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you, you'd take a better care of yourself than I do. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true. I'd have no match for the beard. You don't I mean, you can't touch the beard. beard. There's, there's, only, there's only so far a beard can get you in a fight. Just ask Chuck. <laughs> he fought Bruce Lee. Um, I suppose my closing statement here would be whether or not you agree with what I'm saying, and I know you don't, and it's absolutely fine. I I respect that you have a different, if you like, set of values. You have a different expectation of perhaps maybe how politics can work and what you are optimistic about about the way politics could work then you know we differ on that so of course we're going to differ on a lot of this if you like relatively low level individual example stuff but I do think fundamentally we share a lot of values I wouldn't listen to however many dozens and dozens of podcasts you've done if I didn't think (laughs) there was a lot there that I did feel resonated with me morally if nothing else even if I disagree with you about whatever, individual policies, individual people, individual statements, mm-hmm. you know, I think we'd, we'd come from a very similar moral basis. And I think most decent people do. Um, I imagine most people listening to this podcast do. So, yeah, by all means, let me know what you think of what I've said here. I know my opinions aren't necessarily all that popular. So I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, <laughs> I've lived with that for a long time. Um, and if you want to check out more of my stuff, I've got a couple of websites. I've got spyculture.com, which is all about the relationship between the intelligence agencies and culture manufacture, culture industries. And that's also where you can get my podcast. And I have another web- website, which is on state involvement in terrorism, which is called investigatingtheterror.com. So, yeah, check into those websites and by all means, let me know what you think. James, any final words? Oh, my God, I'm not going to even try and match that speech. But, uh, Guy, uh, thanks for having me on once again. Um, Tom, it's always a pleasure speaking to you. And um, I would love to hook up and uh, meet up with you sometime this year, so we'll, we'll keep in touch. Yeah, absolutely, we'll do that. And thank you, Guy, for having me on. It has been a, it's been a really good conversation, I feel. Absolutely, Tom. You're, you're one of my favorite guests to have on the show. First of all, I think you have a great voice for radio. I've said this to James before off air. Yeah. You have a perfect voice for this type of format, in my opinion. Um, but you're very rational and very sort of calm and composed with everything that you say. You're not alarmist. You're not ranting and raving. And uh, so even if people listening to this have a different viewpoint to you, I think at least they can appreciate that you've given everything that you said today at least some thoughts and some consideration. These are not just sort of wildly formed opinions. And uh, absolutely, everyone should check out Tom's book. It's Secret Spies and 7-7. Seven, seven. And uh, make sure you listen to his new podcast over at spyculture.com. And with that being said, that wraps us up for another edition of the show. So until next time, peace. 
getting your take on Edward Snowden. And I just want to let everyone know if they head over to spyculture.com, you can listen to Tom's podcast where he goes into this uh, in a lot of depth and really provides a, a very well thought out analysis. And I don't mean to reduce, you know, all of his work to just a soundbite or a couple of minutes here. But uh, I know, Tom, that you've displayed a lot of skepticism surrounding um Edward Snowden, his backstory, what he stands for, what he has said, and so on. Um, I, just for full disclosure, I uh, do disagree with you on that, respectfully. Um, I don't share that view, but I'm, as I've said on the podcast before, I like to think that I'm open-minded and just want to give you the opportunity to kind of make your case for why you haven't re- really been certain about his intentions from the beginning. Why, why were you so skeptical about him from the start? I was sceptical about it primarily because of the media coverage. Normally, the media do not linger on a story for very long, and they certainly don't tend to linger on security state stories for very long. So the fact that they were on this suggested to me something out of the ordinary. Because normally when you have a whistleblower, you'll get, if they're lucky, you'll get some proper media coverage and you'll get a sort of brief flurry of interviews and maybe a few follow-up articles, but that'll usually be about it. Then it's yesterday's news, it's chip paper, so people have moved on. With Snowden, the story just ran and ran and ran. And I was kind of... I'm I'm inherently sceptical of anyone who used to work or says they used to work for the security services as to whether or not they really do have, have actually severed that relationship. And nothing that Snowden's done since then, to my mind, suggests that he has severed that relationship. And when you go into the background of who Snowden is, and you look at his entire adult life, he spent the entire time working for different branches of the security state. He joined the special forces when he apparently broke both of his legs in some training training accident or incident. Uh, he drops out of the special forces. Okay, he then goes to work at a advanced psychological research center, which works with the NSA and CIA. He then joins the CIA. He's posted as an undercover agent to Geneva. When he leaves the CIA, he becomes an NSA contractor, and then has this um, this meteoric rise in the NSA to the point that he's apparently this systems administrator who can access absolutely everything and supposedly downloaded thousands, if not millions, of documents. And the whole thing, just to me, because most of the podcasts I've been on have, to be fair, been shows like this one, where you study, you know, you look at all sorts of different things. When you get guests on, you do generally talk about their area of expertise, but you usually get them onto some other topics as well. Um, Mm -hmm. You in particular, Guy, are very good at that. You're very good at getting them off the beaten track, if you like, and so they're not just repeating the same thing that they've said a dozen times before. Um, And so I haven't faced that so much with podcasts, largely because (laughs) I've been fortunate that the people who've invited me on have been good people like you. Um, I have faced that a bit more in as much as I've got involved in the kind of meet-up truth movement that exists in this country, in that most people do just, in that, look on me as a 7-7 guy, and that's all I get asked about. And, yeah, I think you get, I think, it, yeah, I found it more that I've got pigeonholed socially, if you like, rather than in the media realm. Interesting. Well, I think I may have asked you this question the last time that we spoke, or perhaps the time before, and I don't mean this to come out in the wrong way, but we're nine years after 7-7. How uh, fresh is that day on the the minds and and souls, if you like, of the British public? You know, are people still uh, conscious of of, of just what happened that day and how important it was? Or in your view, as someone who studies this and looks at the media coverage of it and so on, has it just become really a, a distant memory at this point? I don't think it's just a distant memory. Um, It's not very present in the minds of most people, hardly any people for that matter. It's it's basically just now part of the background tapestry of British life, that, you know, this horrible thing happened. That's Mm -hmm. basically all it really means to people anymore. Um, 
And I mean, not to not to cut you off, Tom, but it, it's just it occurs to me that for several years after seven seven, people would refer to nine eleven, seven seven, and other horrible uh, acts of terrorism. They would kind of lump those two days together, and now it seems like, of course, nine eleven uh, is something that's, that's always mentioned, and, and seven seven not so much. That's just my perspective. Someone on the the outside looking in. Well, and someone who's living on that side of the Atlantic, but. Sure, to be honest, the British media isn't that different. I'm, I'm not sure, but I would say that 9-11 probably still gets more token media mentions or references in the British media than 7-7 does. Mm. So, yeah, just like I say, it's sort of, when you say 7-7 to people, I think most people it evokes, oh, wasn't that some horrible thing? It was that, those Muslim suicide bombers. And that's about it. Switching gears a little bit here, Tom, I'm very interested in... Smells like human spirit. Okay, welcome back to the show, everyone. I am your usual host, Guy Evans. And firstly, before we get started here, I'd just like to introduce the special guest host for today's podcast, James Wilson. James, how are you doing? Hello, hello. Yes, I'm very well. Thank you, Guy. Thanks for having me on, buddy. Excellent. And secondly, uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, guest for today's show, a returning guest. I think this is either his third or maybe even fourth appearance at this point. He's a researcher, filmmaker, author of the book uh, Secret Spies and 7-7. We always love having him on the show. Uh, as a sidebar, he's also uh, an electronic music creator in his spare time. His name is Tom Secker. Tom, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm very good, Guy. And James, it's, it's good to be talking to you guys again. I guess the natural place to start, Tom, uh, is just by asking you, what have you been up to since the last time that we spoke? I know that you've launched your podcast now, the Clandestine Podcast, which is, seems to be going very well. But in general, what have you been up to since the last time we spoke? Well, that's been the main sort of creative project that I've been doing uh, in that I launched the podcast in, oh, help me out here, August? <laughs> I can't quite yep. remember. Something like that. It was shortly after we last spoke, anyway, because we, we, we were talking about my book last time. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's essentially been a weekly show, apart from a brief hiatus in November, and that was all because I was devoting quite a lot of time to putting together my presentation for this uh, conference in Lille, in France, that James Corbett got me invited to. So thank you, James. And, and that was one of my highlights of last year, really. I had an awful lot of fun there, not just you know, going and doing a presentation that mm. went down pretty well, and you can watch the video of that online, actually. Um, but also getting to meet James Corbett, that was interesting, because this is a guy who I first, I don't know, got in contact with back in 2010, maybe. We'd sort of known each other online for four years before we actually met, you know, in the flesh. So that's a... It, a, it was sort of surreal for a moment, but yeah, we had a lot of fun together. It was It was really good meeting him, so... That's some of the stuff I've been up to. What else would you like to know? Um, this conference, so what was it about? So what did you go into and um, how many people were there? The number of people there varied from day to day. Um, we're talking at most a few hundred. Mm. But wow. it, was, it was an academic conference. It was organised by essentially an academic institute in France. Uh, it's called FOSSA, which stood for, stands for Free Open Source Software for Academia. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, academics are not very good at being short-winded. But yeah, basically it started out as a bunch of software engineers who were particularly into developing open source, that is, community-developed free software that everyone can pitch in and modify and try and develop and enhance and progress. What, um, rather than the Adobe's and this and that? Well, rather than the software, like, yeah, like you say, being owned privately by a corporation yeah. and they own the software and you can't do anything with it. All you can do with it are the options that are built into it that they've provided. So they were into building software, particularly for academic purposes, for, you know, data mining or whatever, analysis of different things, uh, whatever you might use software for, for that matter. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm all for this stuff. Uh, <clears throat> Not that I'm a software programmer, I don't have my head around that, 
but mm-hmm. I use a open source uh, software for my email and for my internet, which is probably the two main things that I use my computer for. So, you know, I'm, I'm all in favour of this, and, and frankly, Internet Explorer is crap, so why mm. would anyone use it? Seriously, if there is anyone out there listening to this still using Internet Explorer, don't. <laughs> any, yeah. any other browser is better. Um, I know there's a, a lot of people, of course, against the Internet Explorer, and um, I know a lot, a lot of a few software developers, you know, um, graphic designers, people who are, um, or especially website developers who are very annoyed um, with, say, Adobe and other big companies coming in and destroying the coding and completely mastering the coding so you can't uh, manufacture it yourself, you know, and they're very annoyed, you know, and they've almost gone out of business. It, it's a sort of a new generation now, sort of a few years later, where all these global companies own all the real code and you can't develop something yourself from scratch anymore. Well, a lot of stuff has been copyrighted and a lot of stuff has been patented and what have you. And, of course, it's the big corporations who got there first, so that's the people who own most of the patents that do exist. Mm. But still, programming is programming, and programmers are generally quite imaginative people. Otherwise, they wouldn't be, you know, messing around with programming, trying to make software do interesting things. Yeah. So they will always find a way around it, and they always have found a way around it. Um, And so, anyway, this conference was about a bunch of programmers involved in all of this sort of thing. And in this year in particular, having run it for several years, mostly for software-type people, they were reaching out to other open-source disciplines. And so they got open-source journalism. There was a whole day devoted to that, and they got people like James uh, Corbett in there, and he suggested me. So... My presentation was on open source intelligence, um, and the title was What Connects the Walsall Anarchists, Nazi Pigeons, and Ben Affleck. And it was a sort of light-hearted introduction to the kind of work that I do and how I go about researching things, where I get my information from, Mm -hmm. and how it is you go about investigating the intelligence services without using secret sources, without using insiders and leaks and all of that kind of thing. So that's what it was about. I'm curious to ask, Tom, uh, you know, how would you rate your experience doing the podcast so far? As you said, you're about six months into the project. I think you've done, uh, if I recall correctly, about 17 or 18 shows at this point. Uh, what's it been like to um, produce this podcast to this point? Um, it's been an awful lot of fun because I was someone who started out being associated primarily with the 7-7 issue and more broadly the state terrorism, Al-Qaeda, war on terror issue. And there's a lot of other things that I'm interested in. At that point, I was very focused on that because there were particular things I wanted to accomplish, like making the two films and writing a book. So making the podcast was one of the main reasons was to enable me basically to talk about other things and see if people were interested in what I had to say on other kinds of topics. So for me, it's been a really interesting experience. I found <coughs> I found that the episodes I enjoyed making the most are the ones that proved the most popular and that other people enjoyed the most. So right. I think there's a real lesson in there for me. Um, it, it, it's very good positive feedback, it's encouraging, but also in terms of going forward with what I'm actually going to do with this, what I'm actually going to try and hope to accomplish by doing this show. I think there is a lesson there for me that I'm best off sticking to the things I most enjoy talking about because um, that's what people want, (laughs) seem to enjoy listening to me talk about, if you like. Sure. Do you think there's a, a danger of being really pigeonholed once you once you sort of come on the scene and start talking about a particular issue? Uh, for you, of course, it was seven seven. That seemed to be every time you made an appearance on a podcast or a radio show or what have you. That was the the topic that you usually discussed. Um, did you find that that after a period of time, people just came to see you as the seven seven guy and actually didn't allow you to kind of broaden your horizons and talk about other things? Um. I didn't find that with podcasts particularly, be- 